All right, hello, people. This is Ron Rambo Kim, and today we have a very special guest. We have Chet from the Valve development team here, and as well as Kyle K. Sharp Miller. They're going to spend some time with us here and answer a bunch of questions that we have from ESCA.net and ESCANews.com and all the fans from there. Chet, uh, I know uh, you don't really know the, the intricacies of the game, like the real technical questions that we have here, but I know, Kyle, you got to try it out firsthand uh, for a couple of days there in the IEM New York tournament. So uh, for any questions that Chet may not know, Kyle, if you could help us out with that. Uh, so I guess first question here was, uh, how long has CSGO been in the works? Um, well, first, uh, it's been a couple of uh, years. Um, it first started off as kind of um, something other than it's become. It's one of the transitions that went through as we were internally playing it, kind of going back to something that we had loved in places we had known and um, really wanting to back it into uh, something that we were really proud of in a full product. So a couple of yeah. years. Okay. Um, and also, how large was the development in the testing team? Um, well, the testing team, everyone at Valve is a tester for all of our products, as well as um, using outside sources um, and uh, people at shows, people like Kyle. Um, you know, so it's it's hard to say what size that is. Uh, the development team g- grows and shrinks. Um, you know, Valve, everyone kind of works on what they want to work on. And during that, some people will be on a project for a month or two. And then maybe they'll move off once they're done with their part of it. And then some people will stay on for the, the full term. Um, so, you know, anywhere from 35 to 50 people. All right. And uh, was there emphasis to match the feel and the gameplay of either 1.6 or Source, or is it like a combination? Or uh, how, what was your thoughts on that? Um, the biggest goal was to say that we wanted to make a Counter Strike. Um, so it's not necessarily to copy one or the other, but not to look to other influences and change what the game's about. I mean, Counter Strike is a very specific thing. Anyone who's played it any period of time kind of understands that. And we wanted to make sure we captured that. Um, when you get down to the details and the way different things go, uh, we always wanted to just try to pick what we thought worked best. Okay. So, uh, it's just make it a Counter Strike game. You don't want to, you know, copy either. It's just a combination of both, really. Um, yeah. I mean, there's, there's some things from each that we like or dislike. Um, but there's also just some things as you're doing anything new, you can't just simply copy. I mean, the minute, you update the graphics. You can just say, oh, give us 1.6 with updated graphics, but you really can't do that because the game changes. All of a sudden, it's harder to be able to uh, pick out something from a distance maybe or maybe character identification changes or weapon identification changes. So, you know, when you do those things, you have to make other changes as well. Okay. And uh, I heard there were different types of game modes. Uh, Can you expand more on that? Correct. Um, we're working with the guys from Gun Game, and we're going to have a couple of versions of Gun Game available uh, right at launch. And then post-launch, uh, we've been talking with some other uh, people as well. I know um, some things like Deathmatch is really popular. Um, some of the zombie mods are popular. There's, a, there's a, you know, the Counter-Strike, both 1.6 and Counter-Strike Source have been around for so long, and have such giant communities that um, people have really developed different ways of playing the game. Uh, I think talking with, uh, you know, like in New York last week, we're talking with uh, very competitive professional players who are focused on one aspect of the game, but they're just one part of the game. There's a lot of people who play the game in different ways. And so, um, you know, gun game will be the first edition and then we'll see what we do after that. Nice. Well, I support anything zombie, anything. So uh, please, if, if you can, yeah, if you could put more emphasis on that, that'd be great. Uh, uh, Kyle, do you have any questions here for Chet? Um, well, I mean, there's this one from the community again. Uh, they wanted to know how uh, the, the bullet penetration will be compared to 1.6 in Source. Um, I know that we touched on this this weekend, um, just about like the type of material that the bullets will go through and the type of damage reduction that I guess um, each shot will incur when it goes through um, that material. I don't know if you want to kind of give my uh, impression of, of how it was this weekend or if you had anything specific you could yeah. talk about it. Because, I mean, our, our answer is simply reasonable. Um, yeah. <laughs> it shouldn't go through five feet of cinder block. That's not reasonable. Um, and um, looking at the forums and Twitter feed and everything else, the answer of uh, reasonable seemed to aggravate some people. 
Um, but so, yeah, if you want to just give it what your impression was, since you know pretty well what 1.6 feels like in CSS, um, you know, I think you, you have a pretty good in, indication on this one. Yeah, um, you know, in source, I guess one of the biggest gripes was that, you know, if, if there was a tiny little pole sticking out and you shot someone through it, even though it was, like, you know, maybe like a centimeter long or something, uh, you know, you would lose 75% of your damage um, uh, from your shot. Um, in Go, they have really kind of tweaked that, I believe, to where, you know, if it's a window or something you're shooting through, you're not going to, it's going to be more like a full powered shot. Um, you're not going to be able to shoot through. Uh, like he said, 15 feet of a, of a thick wall, um, like a 1.6. But again, I think that's uh, that's a change for the better. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's it was a lot of fun for people to to die through a 15 foot wall or to spend 30 seconds at the beginning of each round um, spamming all over the maps. Um, you know, and again, it wasn't fun in source for you to to clip a tiny little bit of a wagon and you know someone someone gets away from you. So I think that they've kind of found a good balance between the two, and this is one of the things that I really did I did like about the game. Well, it, it's funny as if you watch um, the uh, the second last, I guess, tournament or game of the, sh- the tournament where they were on nuke. You yeah. saw a lot of um, wall spamming where it wasn't, I don't think, fun or interesting for the players, but they felt the need to do it. Um, and because there's some places there that just you should be doing it, and that that becomes weird as well. Um, you know, so making it where it's more a part of the action and part of the game, I think, is definitely a payoff. I agree. Right. And um, do you guys know anything about the grenade damage through the walls? Because I know in Source, uh, the grenades don't do damage through walls. In 1.6, it does. Um, I believe the g- grenade damage is limited there. Yeah, it's it's very similar to Source. Uh, one thing we did notice, um, and I don't know if this, I'm sure everything is subject to change, but at least in the version we were playing, um, grenades were doing uh, a very large amount of damage. I think at one point my teammate took a uh, 150 damage nade, so um, I, they're very deadly right now. And uh, the only thing is, again, if you can block them off with a wall or a box or something like that, um, you're not going to take that damage through the wall um, like you would in 1.6. Yeah, that's okay. the, that's definitely. The- that's definitely something that I'll adjust during the beta. Um, one of the things that's always hard to do when you're tuning something like that is you can't start for the middle. You have to start from one end and tune it down towards the other end. If you just start in the middle, you never really know which way you should be going. And so one way to do it is to start with the higher damage, and then we could tune it down. I, trust me, it's already been tuned down. It used to be insane. So uh, it's good. All right. And uh, I know in 1.6 in Source, the DE maps where you plant the bombs were uh, the you know primary type of game mode play. Are there any plans to tweak the hostage and rescue maps to possibly make those useful in competitive esports play? Um, so we we def- we have two of those maps that will be shipping um, office in Italy. Uh, I think the the real barrier to those probably in competitive play is I don't know a competitor who wants to trust AI, and that's what you have to do there. You have to trust that the um, hostages are going to follow you cleanly. Um, so, you know, that's the kind of thing we make changes, we adjust things, we uh, try to make the best game we can, and it's up to the players and the pros and the community to decide um, what's competitive and what's not. Okay. Yeah, I remember 1.6 playing those maps sometimes, and those guys would get stuck in the walls, and you'd have to take them down to win the map. Uh, <laughs> you fly to the top of the map, standing on their heads. The yeah, they would, <laughs> they would boost you 400 feet in the air. Um, but, okay, and also uh, in, from the pictures and the videos that I've seen, uh, in the crosshair there are a bunch of extra lines that we've never seen before in the previous games. Uh, are there any customization modes for the type of crosshairs, and can you implement maybe your own type of graphic? Yeah, I think if you look at um, the exhibition tournament, you'll see everyone else playing with different crosshairs, almost everybody else. A few people were playing with the stock crosshair. Um, discoverability for um, expert players is really easy. Um, if someone's really good at a game or if they're into a game, um, them finding advanced things like tuning the crosshairs is really easy. They're going to do the work. The hard thing is people who aren't advanced, who are kept more casual, um, they're not going to investigate. They're not going to discover. So we have to put what we think works for them best up front. 
so that so it's instantly accessible to them. And then after that, you know, if you jump in and you just want to have plain red or green crosshairs uh, that don't move, you can set that up easily. Um, okay. If I can chime in for a sec on that, actually. Um, I think one of the things that they were doing, which is cool, I, the crosshair does kind of look like there's a lot going on in it, but they really wanted, I think, to um, accurately reflect your recoil um, when you shoot, which is something that the crosshairs these days, while they're intended to, don't really reflect anything accurately um, in terms of recoil, and these were kind of um, built from the ground up to, I guess, assist you with that. So I think that, you know, we just weren't used to it when we were playing there, and it was kind of like, oh, we just want to turn it off and use what we know right now. But I think that there's a lot of good information uh, in those crosshairs, and maybe someday it'll be something that everyone uses. Um, So I think it was definitely something cool that they were working on with it. 